Stanley Whitney um, was born in 1946, is a contemporary African-American artist known for his use of a loose grid of colors in his paintings. Um, he has a wide range of references, including Egyptian and Greco-Roman architecture, jazz music, a blend of the work of Van Gogh, Cézanne, Giorgio Morandi, Mondrian, as well as Rothko and Pollock. Um, he took a very, you know, long time to develop the style that he's arrived at. Um, and, and basically, for the most part, made his living uh, as, as, a, as a teacher uh, while his work was really essentially not selling. Um, and he is not in that position any longer. Um, this, this show, well, let's see. Um, I, I put up this, this, uh, really lovely gouache on the, on the front page. A lot of his work in, in oil paint is very large scale, as you'll see. Um, but, you know, on screen, you can't really see as much of the texture and nuance of the brushwork as as I'd like to. And one of the reasons why I go for these gouaches is because you can see a lot more of the, the, the paint quality and how he applies the paint and the brushwork and all of that. And the guy is a delightful colorist. He is just a wonderful artist as far as I'm concerned. Um, just I've I've always been inspired by his work. He is one of my heroes who stuck with his guns throughout his his career and and really has come up with um, a very unique synthesis. Okay, so um, how high the moon is the first retrospective to trace the evolution of Stanley Whitney's wholly unique and powerful abstractions over the course of his 50-year career. He's, he's uh, 77 now. Uh, the exhibition title is inspired by the uh, 1940 song, which became a jazz standard that has conveyed enchantment, longing, and in some interpretations, reach for the sublime. I did a talk uh, in, in the summer of 2021 comparing and contrasting Stanley's painterly approach to the work with Saul Lewitt's cool, cerebral, concept-driven productions. Lewitt wrote comedically detailed instructions for a crew of artists and other people to execute the work. Um, what both artists have in common is they just come up with really delightful color. So um, below on the on the right is is a uh, installation shot of of the um, show that's up in Buffalo right now. The show is going to travel. It's going to travel to um, uh, someplace in the in the Midwest, and then it's going to end up in Boston at the um, the International Contemporary Art Museum up there. Um, so there are a couple of different opportunities if you get up to to Buffalo for whatever reason. Um, th this show is on there at the, what was called the Albright Knox um, Gallery. They, they're now calling it a, um, what is it? AKG Museum, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, but the, the show is gonna end up in 2025 up in Boston. So, uh, 
Whitney blocks out squares of color that complement and clash against one another, creating a quilt-like quality to the work. I start at the top and work down. That gets into call and response, he explained of his practice. One color calls forth another. Color dictates the structure, not the other way around. So this piece is called uh, Goya's Lantern, and uh, it it's 72 by 72, and this was from 2012. So um, you get the the subtlety and nuance of 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 these pieces. Um, There's really, you know, interesting stuff going on in the in in where the where the squares touch and how the line acts between the stacks of colors and things like that. They're really exuberant and beautiful pieces. Um, let's see. Ah, okay. Like a bricklayer, the artist paints a horizontal band along the top edge of the canvas and then lays down blocks of saturated color from left to right, across and down in a vibrant, wobbly, improvisational grid. He often works with a jazz accompaniment. It's, it's like call and response. The paintings tell me what to do. So um, in on the on the left are some examples from the G's Ben uh, quilters, and that this there's definitely a a relationship that that um, Stanley Whitney has with this work. It's it's something that he has looked at. He's been exposed to. Um, And they're they're very um, you know you can get you can get sort of a sense of the scale of of his of his pieces in this gallery shot in this studio shot. Um, we're not going to feel bad for him. He's got a studio in Bridgehampton, a studio in Manhattan, uh, a studio in 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 Rome. Uh, I think in Rome. It's in it's in Italy someplace. Uh, so. He's no longer scraping by, let's put it that way. Um, but, I, you know, I grudge this guy nothing. Uh, he's earned it. So these are um, some early pieces. Um, let's see. I, I'm going to I'm going to go through a little bit of um, bio thing at this point. Um, yeah, he, he was born in Philadelphia in 1946. His father ran a market. They they moved out of out of um Philadelphia it, into um Bryn Mawr, which is kind of a suburb of of Philly. And and basically his family was kind of held in high regard though they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, according to Stanley, it wasn't like they were wealthy just because he ran a market, had a market. He had a certain social position in the community. He was respect well respected in that in within their community, but it wasn't like you know they had a lot of money. Um, Stanley always loved art, drew when he was a kid, and all that, though had very limited exposure to museums and things like that. He just decided he wanted to go to school. So he started out at, I believe, at 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 Cincinnati Art Institute and then transferred to Kansas City Art Institute. Um, and so he graduated with a um a BFA from from um Kansas City and moved in 1968 to New York. Um, 
he did have a go to a summer program i think it was in skidmore and at that at that um uh summer program he met um philip gustin who was a teacher at that at that program who was a very well known um at the time a very well known abstract expressionist painter um the interesting part was that you know basically gustin also taught at yale and 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 was able to get stanley into yale so stanley went to the master's program at yale um the interest the other interesting part is at, as he was meeting gustin gustin was was in in transition in his work from being a abstract expressionist painter an abstract painter to his kind of cartoon-like um uh very politically uh charged um work if you're familiar at all with his work he he did these large cartoon like you know uh Ku Klux Klan guys driving around in these in these uh kind of box like cars uh smoking cigarettes and getting into trouble um but there's a whole series of political uh cartoon like paintings that he did um, so as he was transitioning from abstraction into representation into in, from from abstraction into representation, Stanley was doing these pieces at that point. And these are very much, you know, Soutine like um, inspired, you know, Van Gogh, um, uh, very expressionistic um, figurative paintings, which look pretty good to me now but he he uh definitely is turned turned away from that um so he graduated he received his MFA from um Yale in 1972 um not interested in making work specifically about his black identity um Whitney had a, a difficult time distinguishing himself during the 70s and 80s when uh, painting abstractions was widely considered out of style because it was really, you know, conceptual art and, and video and performance art and a lot of other things that that was that was really hip at the time. Um, So he um, really stuck with his guns. He was living living down, um, I believe, down in in Soho at the time, and he would, you know, see everything that was going on around him and say, you know, well, should I change what I'm doing? And yeah, no, nah, I'm gonna stick with it. Um, so. It was it was not until the let's see he what what happened was he and his wife Marina um, uh, the uh, he was teaching at Tyler um, uh, College of Art in in um, in Philadelphia and Tyler had a summer program running in in Italy in Rome and so he would go during the summers to to Italy and basically taught there but he was like really in a very different atmosphere he just took himself out of the the New York competitive scene that 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 he had been in and was kind of able to find himself a very different place to be. Um, so let's see. We're going to move on from here. So these are pieces that he that he did while he was at Yale. 
um, and they're very, you know, uh, the the top left and the bottom right piece are his. They are large scale pieces. They are, you know, more or less color field paintings. He was using a mop uh, to to make the marks with. Um, in the on the lower left is Sam Gilliam, who was working around the same time. Um, so it, it was basically um, this was the heyday of the color field painters, um, Helen Frankenthaler and and um, uh, Morris Lewis and uh, Ed Clark who actually Stanley was was close to. Ed, Ed, Ed Clark was one of the only black painters and Sam Gillum, another black painter. Um, there was not a real openness in the art world to black painters at the time. And he used to say, he used to have to kind of hide out when the, when the, uh, um, uh, Black Panthers were around because he wasn't doing any political art and they didn't think much of what he was doing. So uh, kind of an interesting situation. Um, okay. So he was searching around for his his own voice and what he wanted to say with it. Um, seeing Vincent, um, basically he really loved Van Gogh's, Van Gogh's work and, and for him, he saw color in, in these black and white pen drawings that, that Van Gogh would do. Um, and he was constantly drawing and still is constantly drawing. It's one part of his practice is to really draw a lot. So um, Stanley talks a lot about space, space between things, space between the marks, um, uh, change in direction, change in, in, in the quality of the line, um, the density of the marking, lighter wash markings against pure dark marks. So you can see the rhythms and pattern that 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 he's trying to play around with. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of these things, probably hundreds. I, I I've seen them, and I just selected this this sampling so that you get a sense of it. But you can see the Van Gogh down here. Let me see if I can get my, uh, there we go, zoom in. I'm going to blow this up so you can see this. And so you see the variation in the marking and the direction of the marking and all of that. So, um, and you can see, you know, to a much lesser degree but these are large scale drawings this this is 26 by 40 inches where the van gogh is is rather small um and so he's practicing mark making and 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 trying to integrate in some way um some of the gestural business that that you know is in um somebody like Pollock. Okay. And this is from 1979. Um, and I will, I will click on to here and on the, um, the right hand side, that is a Philip Dustin from, from, um, you know, basically his um, probably would be the early 60s, something something along those lines before he had changed over. But you can see sort of a relationship between Gustin and Stanley Whitney. But this is this is what he was 
this is what he was envisioning in these you know the directionality the the marking the clusters of marks and things like that okay so um here was a show that was at Mnuchin uh gallery in New York City last year um uh Giorgio Morandi who has a lot in common and we'll talk I'll talk more about that a lot in common with with Stanley Stanley is stuck with his guns with his with his his rectangles and his cubes and his grid um Sean Scully another one who works works with the grid and works from uh, kind of architectonic sources. Um, okay, and this is back to another um, one of this is this is one of the late acrylics. Stanley um, uh, changed over to oils because he was really feeling like he was getting stuck in these in these acrylics he wasn't getting enough depth and richness out of the color they get very plasticky when they're when they're really thick unless you do some medium things to the paint it it doesn't give you the kind of depth and richness that you get out out of an oil paint so um still exploring this jackson pollock business and trying to integrate color and 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 this all over rhythm and um and really uh this is on mylar so it was it was uh a a kind of really different surface he was doing these to do silk screens from and then and then just real, realized that he really liked the the quality of what he was getting out of them so he stuck with that um Okay. And this is, you know, this is a, a transitional piece in a certain way. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, 16 songs. Um, you can see the beginning of these kind of floating kind of um, increments, these kind of... Um, uh, forms that that coalesce into into the grid later but right now they're floating and there's these white lines that are weaving through it and all that he was you know this is a fairly large scale it's 66 by 108 and then there's a detail over here on on the left and here you have, you know, this is 1990. So at this point, he would be in Europe um, and traveling back and forth. Um, and the forms become these sort of gestural lozenges, but it's also kind of this, this business of the grid is starting to come to the fore. So he's keeping this gestural marking, but he's starting to try and figure out some kind of a structure. He really wanted um, Jackson Pollock mixed with um, uh, Mondrian, uh, the structure, the that structural element, and trying to keep that gestural freshness, but also have that sense of of a um a logical structure to work through so that so that he could release his attention to color it's okay So they began to stack up these these lozenges, and and he started to kind of pile them in in into these linear um, sequences. And this uh, forward to black uh, from 1996 is really a a breakthrough um, into this 
into this grid business that that he that he wants. It's a really lovely painting too. I mean, the underpainting, the 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 those bits of blue showing through the green, the bits of blue showing through the red, and how those those things interact. Um, the the sense of of just kind of energy that's inside those squares that are kind of contained in them. Um, I don't have a color theory. The color is magic. And I want to work, uh, I want the work to be magic. Okay. And again, color bar. This, this is a major, you know, breakthrough. He came to an understanding that, that there's a, a, a kind of density that he wants out of out of his paintings a kind of um stacking of these of these um cubes and rectangles um and the space created by the color by the warmth and coolness by the overlap by how the edges meet um, these are all things that he's starting to really think about more deeply. And by the way, if you guys have any questions, put them in the chat and, and Joan will feed them to me if they're directly related to what I'm talking about. Um, okay. I draw all the time. Drawing kind of keeps you young as a painter. Drawing keeps you dealing with a lot of possibilities to keep you fresh. I think um, every artist needs to reinvent drawing. I like Matisse's drawing and Van Gogh's drawing because that's the kind of painter I am. And Van Gogh's drawings seem to me as rich and colorful as his paintings. So this is this is, you know, one of those periods of time where he's starting to try and work out some of this stuff. And basically what he realized is that that there was an architectonic element to, to his work that he wanted to bring forward, a kind of weight in inside those increments that he was working with. So let's see. Yeah, here, here is the color bar next to the Parthenon. And you can see what, what he's thinking about. He's kind of thinking about the, the, the heaviness, the, the, um, the volume that can be created by color. Um, so this is still got that you know gestural openness but he's also starting to think about how those things are placed next to each other how they're stacked on top of each other um and he went to giza they took a trip he and his wife marina took a trip to giza and this was where it really clicked in for him he saw this very shallow kind of depth, this very shallow kind of building block, and wanted the overlaps and, and those things to be in his paintings. And this we're going to talk a lot more about as, as we go forward. Now we're getting to the mature style of, of Stanley Whitney's work. And um, the piece, the, there's an etching above uh the the pyramid below and if you look at the shapes that are inside the 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 etching they really they really look a lot like those stones that are in the pyramid um but it's also got that grid structure that that level that layering okay so music is a very important part of his work. 
uh, James Brown sacrifices to Apollo. Well, um, you know, it's got it's got both his his uh, his soul roots and and uh, and his European travels in there. Um, from my understanding, Stanley and his wife Marina traveled a lot in the U.S. They went they went out west. Uh, he taught at Berkeley um, for a couple of um, summers, sessions, and things like that. So they crossed the country a number of times, and the vastness of the country really affected him in in a way. He didn't want to paint landscapes. But there, there was a certain kind of dynamic that he was interested in, you know. And seventy-two by seventy-two is a decent size, size piece to spread out in. So what I wanted to talk about in this piece is, if you notice, the center blocks kind of create a pyramid. You know, this this light area that's that's built up in in that center is kind of a, a, a pyramid-like shape. Um, there's also progressions that are happening on the sides. So on the left, on the right side, you see this yellow orange block at the bottom, this reddish brown block in the center, and then this darker, deeper, rich, Indian red sort of at the top. Um, so there's a progression of lighter to darker to darker. On the left-hand side, it's going from lighter at the top. Then there's this middle tone blue. Well, it's still a dense, pretty dark blue, but, but not as dark as the black below it. So there are things going on on the sides. There's, there's the textural business, you know, the washes of, of the brushwork in, in, you know, you can see it, especially in the blue block in the, on the um, uh, third from the bottom <laughs> layer um, and, and in the black, and you can see it in the sky color that that's up in, up in the top square. So there's there's different qualities of of brushwork in here. I don't know if I can if I if this is a good enough. Let's see if I can zoom in and see. Yeah, it's it's a decent enough reproduction, so you can kind of see. And look at how that 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 little green wash underneath this orange over on the left makes that makes that little that orange square kind of pop forward. You know, it's almost like there's a shadow cast by it. Um, and here, again, this, this stroke that's in the center uh, goes from this kind of light beige, warm putty sort of color into the white. And I'm going to click out again. And when you look at that, what that mark does across underneath that, that, that blue, it really makes that, that white pop out. If that was not there, it wouldn't quite be the same painting that, that, that blue would not sink and the black would not sink quite as far in as they do. So just trying to draw your attention to some of the things that are going on. And these are not fast paintings. It takes time to really look at them. You know, even, even on the bottom where there's that little blue, um, uh, let me pop up the zoom again. Um, you've got this area down here with, the, with this kind of blue-white where the overlap is happening those drips in the in the other other rectangle are kind of sunk behind it where that white is kind of popping out over the top of the of the the horizontal line and and the the other rectangle is sitting back with those drips pushing it back 
all this stuff is intuition, but it's 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 really conscious at the same time. He's he is doing these improvisationally, but there's there's a lot of of um experience behind it. Okay. And not to forget Giorgio Morandi. And okay, the the parallels between Morandi and Stanley Whitney have to do with tenacity, have to do with sticking with it. Those same bottles were the same bottles that Morandi was painting for over 50 years. And they became these kind of architectonic um, uh, symbols. Um, the 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 kind of wobbly lines between those boxes in the still life up up in the up in the upper right are the same kind of wobbly lines that are going on inside Stanley's inside Stanley's work. And you can see this little sketchbook down below in the center, which is some pages from Stanley's work. I'd love to stay here for longer, but I've got so much to move on to that I got to keep moving. I love, I love Mirandi. You know, one of the things that I also did was pick out this, this etching so that you could see, I'm going to zoom in so that you could see how much went into him getting to those simplified drawing, these patchings, this, this, this mapping out of the space, of the still life, of the space between objects, all of this done with, with an etching needle. And, you know, just fantastic, you know, control. And when you look at that and you go to these deceptively simple looking drawings, there's a lot happening here. So, all right, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Reluctantly. Okay. And I just wanted to point out in this painting, again, uh, Songbird, uh, a lot of sound, a lot of crossover. Um, I wanted to point this out. This section in here, the the two blue, the blue square and, and the blue rectangle, square-ish, um, that the those drips that he lets go down over the top of the the blue that's in the in the um, the horizontal really sets that out on top of it, and you see this little liver in there of the red, and you can see how you know basically there's a spatial thing that's happening there where where this one pops out because of those drips and he let those drips be there it, if if those were not serving his purpose they would be gone okay and i'm going to go back to the mirandi still life See, see the, the line between those two blocks and the line between the two blocks of the, of the blue. Uh, okay. So, um, so this is uh, Ornette Coleman, uh, Dissonance, harmony between the colors. Basically, um, Ornette Coleman's jazz was the inspiration for this piece, and I'm sure he was listening to it when he, you know, around the time he painted it. Uh, not necessarily painting this at the same time as 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 each as each um, uh, movement took place in Coleman's work, but. Um, Mm 
the nuances in this painting are are quite quite profound, and I could talk a long time about that. Though I I see from my timing that I need to keep moving. Um, one thing that 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 I'll point out in in this painting is is that that um, blue uh, rectangle that kind of really bright blue. Um, sort of cerulean um uh blue was connected to the horizontal but he takes this stroke of red and squeezes that thing and you see that he leaves a little edge for it to for it to bleed in to the to the to the other to the other blue uh it, it's you know it's a marvelous moment and there's a lot of other marvelous moments in this painting, but we're not going there. <laughs> um, okay. Um, ah, yeah. The, the, there's there's also this business of transparency of of where that blue on the on the third layer meets the the. Uh, orangey yellow and that that space in between and that hovering that's happening there um again uh he looked long and hard at, at rothko and the hovers and the softness and the the places where things meet um and you know that that this bright um kind of uh canary yellow that's that's in in kind of the center of of the thing um of the painting really pops um uh, and this is you know this is 2012 so this is really kind of getting get more recent um and here's the three of them together i wanted to put this up um uh, so you could really kind of see the 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 variation and nuance that's happening in these paintings. Okay. Uh, all right. I wanted to get to these washes because they're they're really wonderful and and you can see a lot of the brushwork and things like that in them. They're really fresh and beautiful, and and they're fairly you know twenty two by thirty is not a small size for a watercolor. Um, so these are gouache. It's opaque watercolor. Let me see if I can get my zoom up. And there we go. And we're going to zoom in a little bit. So you can see the mark making and and how he allows the the um, the colors to bleed into each other in in certain spots and others he holds back. The spaces, the white spaces, are important in that in that particular piece. I'm going to keep moving because these are gorgeous, and I've got. A, I, I would have. I would have done the whole story on 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 these gouaches if I could. But, uh, so. Oh, wait a minute! Didn't mean to go that fast. Uh, <laughs> um, you know the bleeding of of that of that that um that yellow into that greenish blue, uh, the teal, um. And the, the kind of feathering of of that, uh, the thing, the the other thing that I wanted to show is zoom in on this, the texture of uh, that kind of reticulation that's happening with these washes. They're really, you know, he's just like allowing the paint to do what it does. They are really fun and. You know, it again, it's this jazz business. They're really improvisational, but they are they are kind of harmonic um, um, 
progressions. And that is something that, you know, is really quite lovely. Again, they pop, they dance around. <laughs> I understand the show is quite large too, up up in up in uh, up in Buffalo. Okay, and on this one, I just wanted to say, you know, the transparencies in this one are really lovely. Um, you know, that top there's that top layer of um, of brown that's kind of overlapping over the over the the squares and rectangles that are underneath it and it's almost like a three-dimensional quality to it uh, which really is something that he's after it's really something that he's you know as those stones in 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 giza spoke to him he's continued to listen um beautiful that 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 blue hazed over the top of that that magenta in the in that central horizontal. And here's the man at work. <laughs> and so you get the idea of the scale and, and you know, how we'd set up and just go at it. Okay. Memory garden. The transparencies are really important. Um, the you know, for example, in in this one, contextual color is really important. So, you know, the pink that's up in that square in the upper right hand corner to me reads darker than the pink in the rectangle on the left because of the dark that's surrounding the the rectangle on the left it appears to be much lighter okay and this is something um i skipped over something which is important and i'm going to focus back on it right now which is he studied at yale with Joseph Alberts, who was another guy who stuck with his guns. Homage to Square was something that Joseph Alberts worked on for over 50 years. Um, he also, these pieces are from his trips to Mexico, where he used the, um, the, uh, pyramids the 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 um the mayan temples as as the structures to do his color projects on but contextual color the interaction of color was joseph albert's thing and and uh stanley whitney was there at yale while Albers was still teaching there. Albers was the head of, of the Yale Art Department um, for many years. And I found these lovely pieces that are a lot less um, uh, rigid than, than a lot of his other work is. And on the, on the right is Sean Scully, who actually has a, a real, you know, affinity for, uh, using the architectural stuff as the as the jumping off point for his his abstraction and here we have mondrian and we have an unfinished mondrian which it really shows his thought process it shows you how he's laying things in it's really you know quite exciting to me um it's like the moment of creation it's the this rough transitory um period so full of possibilities 
Um, it could go a number of different ways at this point. And, and, you know, it's just to look at this process, it, it really is something that, that, you know, gives you a very different feel for those polished, finished pieces that you see in the museums. And this drawing on the, on the right is spectacular too. And it hops around a lot and has all that, those cubes and all of that. Now, Mondrian worked with the grid, but 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 did not stick with it. He used his intuition to to place those things and to get those squares and rectangles to interact in ways that were quite unique and quite his own. Um, and it was it was an intuitive process for him, which he does not get. Uh, enough uh, credit for. And here is Stanley at work. <laughs> so these are some monotypes that he was working on in 2021. And here's some pages out of his notebooks. Uh, Always running from the police refers to Whitney's own experience growing up in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see the kind of frenetic energy in that in that in that piece and kind of panic. Uh, and then there's this other one, uh, 2020, no prison life. And interesting piece because it's kind of like the bars are are loose. Uh, they're floating. Um, it's kind of a liberation of the bars. Uh, oh, and here's Marina Adams, who is his wife. Um, and she is an artist also, does these wonderful um, abstract pieces herself. And um, Marina's garden is a stint. Stanley Whitney's piece that we're gonna actually close this out with. Uh, so how high the moon is on until May uh, 26th up in up in Buffalo, but it's going to be in Boston, uh, April of 25 through um, uh, September. So there is a possibility of getting there. Um, Stanley Whitney Painter is on YouTube. Really good talk. Um, he, it was from 10 years ago, so it's a little dated, but, but he does this talk at, uh, the school of visual arts. So he's talking to a lot of artists and it's well worth a listen. Um, there's also a shorter talk, um, with Stanley Whitney and this, and this, um, uh, gallerist from Mexico. Um, and that conversation is about 20 minutes long. So it's, Definitely worth tuning into. Um, this show, Dance With Me Henry, was a show that was down at, at the Baltimore Museum. They mixed Matisse pieces that they have in their collection with, with Stanley Whitney. Um, I really thought it was a, a lovely idea. So I threw that in there, but the show is down already. That show was uh, only on until uh, sometime in 2023. I can't remember what. So to celebrate Women's History Month, we'll explore a weaving and textile show at the Metropolitan um, on March, uh, I guess it's March 1st is the next the next meeting that we're gonna have. So there we have it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Thank you all for coming and have a safe weekend.